Western Australia. A state so massive that it alone accounts for one third of the total land area of the country. From lush eucalypt forests in the southwest to the vast outback plains in the center, this 2.5 million square kilometer region is incredibly diverse. Our three month journey through Western Australia turned out to be a real challenge as we not only tackled the tough 1,000 kilometer long Mandabidi Trail, but also found ourselves traversing one of the hottest and most remote regions we have ever been. So join us on our adventure as we cycle Australia's largest state and conclude our 8,000 kilometer trip halfway round the Red Continent. Already the trail does not disappoint. <laughs> Mundabidi, by the way, means path through the forest in the language of the Nunga people, who are acknowledged as the traditional owners and custodians of the land the Mundabidi Trail runs through. And the trail is um, Western Australia's only long distance off road cycle trail. And yeah, of the over 1,000 kilometers, supposedly over 800 kilometers are unpaved. Um, a lot of it going through the incredible forests of yeah, southwestern WA. And we're so excited to yeah, finally get off the highway because for the better part of the last month we've been on the highway as uh, yeah, we were crossing the Nullarbor and there weren't any other options um, yeah and now it's already so so nice and we are going to enjoy this very much <laughs> construction on the Mandabidi trail first began in December 2001 with the trail being fully completed end-to-end -end in April 2013 from Albany in the south to Mandaring near Perth in the north. The 1,072 km long cycling trail is comprised mostly of rail trail sections, single track and forest roads and passes through eucalypt forests, farmland and along the stunning southwestern coast of Australia. So there's a storm coming, you can kind of see it already behind us and it's been kind of drizzling a bit uh, already during the day now and it's meant to start at any point and the wind's been getting stronger and uh, we're about eight kilometers away from a shelter. This will be our first shelter um, going north from Albany and we're pretty excited to see how that is. 
and hopefully we can make it there before the rain starts. So here we are. This is the shelter. And it is just pouring now. <sighs> so a little bit too late, but better than not at all. Twelve purpose-built shelters were constructed on the Mandabidi Trail as part of the initial 10 million Australian dollar development of the project. Being mostly 40 to 60 kilometers apart in the forest areas between towns, they offer cyclists a safe and comfortable place to cook, sleep and fill up water from their rainwater tanks. big advantages of riding this trail in winter is that um, because parts of the trail are pretty sandy um, in winter when it, there's a lot more rain the sand is pretty firm and it's pretty easy to ride and from what we've read in the summer months when it's really dry the sand is really loose and can be quite a pain of course you have <laughs> the downside of it being wetter in winter is that yeah it's pretty much rained or even been pouring every single day now. Valley of the Giants right now, which is a famous uh, valley as the name suggests, 
where these giant red tingle trees uh, grow and they're a type of uh, eucalyptus tree and they're huge they can grow up to 75 meters high and are some are thought to be around 400 to 500 years old so it's really impressive and they're huge as you can kind of see here <laughs> oh wow look at that one that's huge that's huge yeah wow wow <laughs> wow. Wow. Now that is a giant. <laughs> what? The name Red Tingle stems from the thick and rough reddish bark that stretches from the base of the trunk to the thinnest branches of the tree. The large buttressed bases found on some specimens not only help prevent the shallow rooted trees from falling over, but also aid in the collection of nutrients in the often nutrient poor soil found in the region. Over the years, bushfires have hollowed out the bases of some red tingle trees, creating such large caverns that you can walk or even cycle through them. The red tingle tree, however, is not the only giant endemic to the southwest of Western Australia. The Kerry tree, typically found in higher rainfall areas, can actually grow even taller. After spending the last nights at all these incredible shelters on the trail, tonight we are wild camping and we found this really amazing camp spot right next to a huge carry tree. It goes all the way up there and it might well be the tallest tree we've seen on the whole trail or in general, I don't know. <laughs> and I don't think the camera can really do justice to how big it actually is. So we thought um, about flying the drone up there to give you some perspective of the height and also to measure it to see yeah, how tall it actually is. <laughs> So we are at 30 meters now, 32 meters. Let's see how high this tree goes. Going up, going up. Really have to keep an eye on it. At 55 meters now, I'm gonna put the gimbal up a bit so we can see. Whoa, it's still going up, it's still going up. 70, I think that's it. 70 meters, 72, something like that. Wow, that's crazy. 72 meters, that's just so massive. And it's not even the highest these trees can grow. Um, the carry trees can um, be up to 90 meters tall. And that actually makes them one of the tallest tree species in all of the world. <laughs> Insane. All right, so now we're at the top, around 72 meters. And now we wanna show you how small we actually look. So I'm gonna pan down slowly. Dun, 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 dun. And there we are. <laughs> that is tiny.
forests are definitely one of my favorite environments to cycle in um, because no matter what forest uh, the atmosphere is usually so peaceful and it's so nice cycling here and uh, right now you could easily forget that we're in Australia <laughs> because um, for example in South America we were also cycling through many forests with uh, lots of eucalyptus trees um, but then suddenly there's a kangaroo or an emu crossing the street just in front of you and then you're reminded that you are <laughs> in Australia still. <laughs> Having completed the first half of the trail, we left the Mandabidi behind for almost two weeks to visit Toby's relatives living in Margaret River. The region, most known for its wine production, tourism and surfing locations, is also scattered with vast and intricate cave systems, like the Mammoth Cave, just a few kilometers south of Margaret River. Thousands of fossils have been found in the caves, with many belonging to extinct Australian megafauna. By reaching the Indian Ocean, we officially finished our east to west crossing of Australia and thereby hit another huge milestone on our journey around the world. But our ride through Western Australia didn't end here. All right. So we are back on the Mandabidi Trail, on the second half of the Mandabidi Trail after leaving Margaret River yesterday and cycling back to Nanup and rejoining the trail. And we had a really nice time with my relatives there and um, spent some really yeah, just relaxing days there and it was so great to meet them again. And it's pretty cool to think that we have now officially cycled across Australia um, out by reaching the Indian Ocean and it's been 5,300 kilometers, something like that, uh, since we left Sydney. So we've come quite a long way already in Australia. It's not zugewachsen. Ah, uh, ow! Ah, some of these plants are really thorny and they're like everywhere growing over the trail. <laughs> So it's raining again, of course. <laughs> it's uh, I think it's pretty much rained every single day we've been on the trail now. Yeah, maybe one or two exceptions. But yeah, but <laughs> not many. And yeah, we really just can't say it enough, but these shelters are incredible. They have saved us from the rain so many times. Yeah, it's just, it's awesome.
So this is the first time on the trail that we have to push a bit longer. So far we've been able to cycle almost everything and only had to push maybe for 10 or 20 meters and then could cycle again. But uh, here is now a small path that's very narrow because of all the vegetation. Then the terrain is technically a bit more difficult and it's pretty steep. And yeah, this combination uh, makes it a bit hard to ride all of it. So now we're pushing, <laughs> but I guess it's a lot of fun to go this downhill. But yeah, as we're going northbound, for us it's uphill. <laughs> After a few more tough days on the northern half of the Mandabidi Trail, we eventually said our farewells to the beautiful forests we had immersed ourselves in for the past weeks to face our next adventure, the Outback. been two weeks already since we've left the Mandabidi trail and since then we've come a long way further north. <laughs> Yesterday we arrived in the small town of Malawa and here we slept at the caravan park for one night and today we are about to start our outback route. <laughs> and uh, yeah as you can see we're carrying a lot of water yeah. um, and that's because <laughs> the next couple of weeks going north through the western Australian outback it's gonna get pretty remote. Yeah. Um, there's going to be some long water carry stretches up to 200 kilometers even more and um, the only thing the only place to get water will be some permanent water holes and cattle stations pretty much yeah. so yeah it's going to be pretty exciting at the moment we have 23 liters on our bikes in total and um, it's going to be even more for some yeah. parts um, and 15 days of food we have packed as well so <laughs> The yeah. poor bikes. The poor bikes, yeah. It's uh, going to be pretty crazy and yeah. we're pretty excited. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> a list of all the places where we will be hopefully able to fill up water and as Toby mentioned some will only be uh, permanent water holes or cattle stations but the first one now will be Murchison settlement which is exactly 200 kilometers far away from Malawa. The Outback defined as the extensive remote and sparsely populated region of Australia is so immense that it spans several different climate zones in the country. From the tropical and monsoonal regions in the north to the arid, semi-arid and temperate areas in the center and south. Our 1,400 km route through Western Australia's Golden Outback not only followed parts of the historic wool wagon pathway, but also brought us to the legendary Mount Augustus, deep into the Gascoigne Murchison area.
So yesterday we left Murchison Settlement and are now in the real outback, so to say. <laughs> We've been only cycling on gravel roads now and it's been really remote. I think yesterday 20 cars or so passed us. So um, yeah, really not a lot of people and everything we hoped it would be. <laughs> and now we, after 150 kilometers, um, we reached a very important spot for us which is Bilungpul or Bilungardi in the language of the Wajari people, although I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. And this is one of the few permanent waterholes in the area, permanent meaning that it doesn't dry out, completely dry out, um, even in the dry season. And uh, I'm actually standing in the Bilung Creek, um, which, is, which can be in flood in the wet season and over there, and there's, uh, I think, even a waterfall coming down um, when it's when it has been raining a lot. So yeah, a bit hard to imagine that right now. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely enough water um, to fill enough water left now for us to fill up some water. So yeah, we're gonna start filtering now. <laughs> And you've probably noticed it already anyway, but we've actually made some setup uh, modifications to Luisa's bike um, to allow us to accommodate all this water which we need for cycling here in the outback. Um, we've gotten rid of Luisa's front panniers uh, by repacking quite a bit and also getting rid of a few things and uh, replaced her low rider now with two bottle cages and two very large water bottles. Um, and in general, just with all the extra bottles we have here, here, and so on, everywhere, um, we can just transport a lot of water between 26 and 28 liters now maximum uh, in total on both bikes. And with this capacity, we've been able to go two and a half, three days in the outback heat now. And um, yeah, which is really good because these places to fill up water don't come too often here. And um, yeah, but Louisa's bike, it's not the only place we've made some modifications. <laughs> I've also made some modifications to my hair. Yeah, definitely also better in the heat. <laughs>
I think this was one of the nicest and coolest wild camping spots we've ever had. We are literally in the middle of nowhere and it was just so peaceful last night and we could see the the Milky Way above us and it was just it was so cool and it just got us thinking I don't think we've ever or maybe once or twice in this whole two year two plus year journey and maybe not even have ever been in a place camped in a place where we were I don't know 99% sure that there was no other person within like a 50 or 70 kilometer radius of us it's just so hard to think or maybe I've never in my life I've probably never been in such a situation it's just it's cool it's really gets you thinking it's pretty pretty unique out here and what we're doing out here Very good. It's all right. It's only 10 kilometers. It's 10 kilometers. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> It's been five days now since we left Murchison Settlement and now we can finally see Mount Augustus and that means we're getting close to the Mount Augustus Tourist Park. Um, our next stop to fill up water and get some snacks and other food and also we will probably spend the night there and get a shower. <laughs> And also probably take a rest day there tomorrow um, because the last days it's been pretty tough um, with all the heat and the dust and the gravel roads and we've been averaging about 80 kilometers a day um, yeah because we are limited due to the amount of water we can carry and uh, yeah many hours in the saddle so we definitely can use a break Mount Augustus, known in the Aboriginal language of the Wajari people as Beringora, is a prominent Inselberg with an elevation of approximately 1,100 meters above sea level. It is more than twice the size of the more famous Uluru, but unlike the giant rock in Australia's center, Mount Augustus is not a monolith. Rather, it is an asymmetrical anticline in which layers of different rock have been folded into an arch over millions of years. In the Wajari dreamtime story of Mount Augustus, the shape of the mountain represents a boy, Beringora, lying on his belly after dying from injuries sustained in a conflict with his tribesmen. Even today, Historic Aboriginal habitation is still evident on the mountain by engravings found on various rocks and rock walls. Today we are enjoying a really nice rest day here at the Mount Augustus Tourist Park in the middle of nowhere and um, yeah just giving our muscles and everything a rest after the the tough days we just had now coming from Murchison Settlement and um, we're also using this day to plan our upcoming route a bit um, we want to go to Coral Bay and um, that's about 500 kilometers remaining to Coral Bay, of which 300 kilometers are on gravel roads. And um, yeah, there's really not much an infrastructure all the way now. And um, we really have to see where we're going to get some water. We've been able to fill up on some, uh, some snacks here, but uh, water is going to be a big challenge, um, especially because it's meant to be really hot the next days. And um, we've called, been able to call at a few of the cattle stations, which is essentially the only kind of infrastructure along the way now. Um, call some of these cattle stations and find out if people are actually there um, and if we're able to get some water there. And it, it's looking pretty good. So, yeah, that's kind of our plan now. Ooh, 
it is hot today. There's a heat wave at the moment and uh, we can definitely <laughs> confirm that. My thermometer now says it's 46.6 degrees. Of course, I think this is exaggerating a bit because it's been in the sun. Um, but the, the forecast for the next couple of days has always been around 38, 39. Whoa. That's pretty damn hot. Awesome. So, first refill at a station. This is Cobra Bangamal. Uh, was no problem. They. Uh, yeah, they topped us up completely, which is really good because it's always a bit of a gamble if, of course, you can, there are people currently at the stations and, and so on, and if you can get there. But yeah, that's awesome. This is a former sheep station. I think the rest we're gonna reach are cattle stations and still active, some of them. But yeah, this one was a former sheep station out here in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> the second car we saw today so now after Mount Augustus it's gotten much more remote <laughs> Okay, we started in Australia, we started from Sydney, we flew into Sydney here. Yeah. So this was the second station now and we were able to fill up water, uh, yeah, which is great. The people so far are really nice to us <laughs> and uh, yeah, they actually have an airplane here. We just also cycled across the airstrip, but I guess that's, that comes pretty handy here in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> But yeah, now it's about, uh, I think, 140 kilometers to the next station. Um, but we have everything full. It's about almost 30 liters, so we should be okay. <laughs> God, it's again so hot today. We are still in the middle of the heat wave and just now we're taking a lunch break, a long lunch break, like three hours <laughs> to yeah, stay in the shade and avoid the um, sun around noon because it's way too hot. And uh, I think the only times um, it has been this hot on our whole journey was maybe in Croatia and then again I don't know, Mexico and Guatemala. Um, but yeah, every time we had a heat like this before, there was usually enough infrastructure around. Um, so you would cycle a bit in the heat and you, then you could um, get somewhere inside with AC or so, or at least proper shade. You could get enough water, a cold Coke, I don't know, something like that. And here there's literally nothing for days and yeah, you just gotta take the shade you find underneath the bush. And especially with the water, we gotta be careful. Um, we did fill up 30 liters this morning, but it's incredible how much you drink when it's so hot. Um, so yeah, we still always think, ah, yeah, is it enough until we reach the next place to fill up water? So you always have that in the back of your mind and can't just pour water over your head to cool yourself down or so. You have a few flies on your back.
I have a few flies everywhere. <laughs> oh my god. Today is especially bad. It kind of feels like. Do I have a lot as well? Can you see? Yep. <laughs> yep. So the longer we are in one place, the more flies are getting towards us and it's really annoying. We can't eat before it's almost dark because completely it's only dark, completely dark when the sun is set because only then the flies vanish. <laughs> It's 5.30 in the morning now and we are about to leave. The sun is probably going to rise in about half an hour or something. Yeah, like around six, yeah. Around six and um, yeah, it's a special day because today is the last day of gravel of off-road that we are going to cycle now here in the outback. Yeah, so the last proper outback day, the proper, feel like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Um, Today, our plan is today to camp just in front of the highway before we turn back onto the highway and then um, it's another 200 kilometers on the paved highway or paved roads um, to Coral, Coral Bay. Bay. Yeah. And then uh, that's pretty much the end of our experience of yeah. cycling in Australia, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> and the good thing is we have a really strong tailwind today, so yeah, we gotta, it's gonna be nice. We've got to make the most of it by starting yeah. really early. Yeah. Just a few kilometers left until we reach the highway and uh, then it's less than 200 kilometers left to Coral Bay so we can then take another rest day or two for snorkeling <laughs> and uh, even though it's been pretty tough and also right now the road is terrible really corrugated um, we're so glad that we still did this outback tour um, because it was for the end of Australia the one adventure we were still missing <laughs> and yeah it was pretty cool pretty exhausting as well a real challenge um, but yeah nevertheless we wouldn't want to miss this experience Ooh, there is a car coming the Seventh today. Oh, something like that. Yes. <laughs> After a very early start to beat the incredible outback heat, we arrived in Coral Bay on the Indian Ocean the following afternoon. The lush forests of the southwest seemed so far away, and so long ago by the time we reached Coral Bay, that it almost felt like we had traveled through two different continents the past months. The sheer size and diversity of Western Australia cannot be fully put into words or pictures and must either be experienced or contrasted to show just how unique this part of Australia and this part of the world really is.
can find my way We got everything here At least to stay alive And the time that we share Makes it all